Hi, I'm Mark Stoudemire, host and creator of Get to the Joke, a web series that is a master class in the art of stand-up comedy. I hope you find today's episode to be both fun and helpful, and you can help me out by subscribing to my YouTube channel and liking the video, and feel free to drop a comment. I'll be happy to get back to you. All right, well, let's get to the joke. I'm Mark Stoudemire, a comedian from Philadelphia. As you can probably imagine, I don't have much going on uh, right now. Uh, I can tell you the most exciting thing I had going on this week was my buddy called me up. He was like, hey, Mark, found this cat outside. So I neutered him, gave him his shots, and I rescued this cat. You want to come over and see my cat? So I got some better to do. I walked like 45 minutes to come see this cat. Showed this guy's house. Cat's not even there. The dude, where's this cat goes? Oh, it's an outdoor cat. <laughs> outdoor cat? Let me get this straight, fella. You found a cat outside, cut its balls off, and put it right back outside. <laughs> Seems like a pretty raw deal for that cat. <laughs> Story has another turn. This guy has two other cats. They're both house cats. That house has outdoor cat feels. Like, oh, outdoor cat, don't be coming in here. See all this food and air conditioning and love? That's not for you. You can't run back outside, you outside cat. Now I know how Cooper Manning feels. Nobody. All right. For those who don't know, Cooper Manning is Eli and Peyton Manning's other brother. <laughs> There's a reason you never heard about Cooper Manning, because nobody cares about Cooper Manning. He's an outdoor cat. <laughs> And today's guest is Jim Tews, uh, who originally from Philadelphia, but now lives in New York City. Uh, Jim has been on Last Comic Standing, uh, Just for Laughs, and he's a regular at the Comedy Cellar. So pretty much Jim does all the things that one day I hope to do. Um, Jim, it was such an honor to get Jim on this web series. He's truly uh, uh, such a gifted comic and just an overall nice guy. He let me have access to everything. I got to see his notebooks. I got to see how he develops these jokes that I've been a fan of. He, I got to see how he was able to develop them, how he writes them. Uh, I learned so much from this interview with Jim. I mean, he, he's, on a, he's on a whole other level uh, than I am, and it's just great to get uh, access into that mind of his. Um, I am so fortunate that he sat down with me and we got to talk about his childhood and how he got into comedy and most importantly uh, how he um, is able to get those jokes that I just love so much um, out and how he was able to create two such classic albums which um, I will have links to in the show notes here. So let's go, I'll stop my babbling so we can go ahead and get to the episode. Thanks for being here. New York. Yeah, New York City, greatest city in the world, pretty good place, not too bad. It's crowded, but at least it's expensive, that's what I always say. Is it noisy? Yeah, sure it is, but you know what? It's also unwelcoming. Is it, is it hectic? Go, go, go all the time? Is everyone always in a rush? Yeah, yeah, they are, but you know what? They're pretty lonely, too, so... A lot, of, a lot of downsides, but there's also some downsides. And I feel like if you can make it here, then you probably have help from an outside source. I don't know. I don't know how anyone does this. You, you move here because you have like a goal or a dream or whatever, you know, and then you're here for like six months and you're like, oh my God, what a terrible idea. I'm going back to where I came from. But then you're like, I can't do that. I can't admit defeat. So you stay. 
And I think that's what's been happening since the original Dutch settlers. <laughs> I think even they got here and like two weeks in, they were like, no, no, man, we're going back. We're going back to the Netherlands. And somebody else is like, no, we're not. I'm not gonna prove my dad right. <laughs> we're gonna stay here. We're gonna write letters home. Tell him there's an energy or some other immeasurable bullshit. <laughs> that's how New York got so expensive. A lot of people here think I'm Jewish. Uh, I'm not. But they ask me if I'm Jewish. And they've only been asking me in the last two years, which means I'm aging into Judaism. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that, but that's what I'm doing. I was born and raised a little Christian boy, and I will die an old Hasidic Jewish man. Calling Jim Hughes. Hey, oh, I like the beard, dude. What's going on? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I was giving up, you know. <laughs> I was like, is that Ari Shafir? Like, what the fuck? I didn't... <laughs> oh, hey, what's up, Kat? But uh, first of all, how are you doing with everything, with the coronavirus and just life right now? Um, yeah, I'm in New York City. I'm in my, I've been in my apartment the whole time, except for, like, um, in, I think, early June. Okay. Um, we went back to Allentown for, like, three days yeah just to get out just to see my parents because i didn't know when yeah i didn't and you know like they, our rentals were still kind of cheap yeah and i didn't know when we'd get back again if we didn't do it like yeah well, well then, what's it what's it like being surrounded by covid because that's like the stereotype that we get anyone outside new york city thinks that new york city is just like engulfed with covid <laughs> do you know people that have covid or well, it, uh, yeah, I knew uh, Shane Torres got it, but he wow. got it uh, in, when he was in L.A. And then there was another New York comic uh, named Noah. He got it. Um, there, but there's not, like, a lot. Not a lot of the people that I speak to on a regular basis. I, I Shane is probably the closest person I know. Okay. Um, and he's doing okay? Was, like, we, we were like, yeah, he's fine. Um, he said it was... He, it was like he had the flu for a couple of days, but wow. Um, yeah, like I mean, we, we actually specifically, I'm in Queens, mm -hmm. which was the worst. Yeah. Of all of New York for a minute. Yeah. But now our numbers are better. Were you like afraid to like? like I'm sorry. Outside. I was just, yeah, I was gonna say, were you afraid to just like walk around? Because I have my best friend from high school lives in Brooklyn. And he was like, yeah, I take my dog to the dog park and I go see my brother. And we go, I was like, what? I was like, are you not afraid? He's like, it's everywhere. It's like, I can't, unless I just sit in my apartment for four months, I'm not going to, you know, so it's kind of crazy to like, I don't know, be well, in your situation. Thing, like, at first, I'm like, I was less afraid of getting it than I was like getting it and giving it to my elderly neighbors. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like shit like that. Because <clears throat> it's like, you know, statistics wise, like if I got it, I'd yeah. be sick for a while, yeah, and then be relatively fine. But I don't want to, I don't want to like affect somebody else's life. Yeah. Um, no, I understand. But at first, it was weird. It was weird at first because you know, you're like, holy shit, there's. It's like hard to avoid anybody. Yeah, especially New York. <laughs> That's what I mean there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, even if you're, you know, even if everybody follows the rules, like it's people's like natural, um, flow to not give anybody else that much space. Yeah. You know, I just like, even today I walked by the T-Mobile store by my house Yeah. and I could see in and they had the stickers on the floor like everybody does. Yeah. And, and people were just still standing in these little clusters <laughs> together. And I'm like, it's just what everybody's kind of used to. So it's like, I think a lot of people, a lot more people here were being cool about it mm -hmm. than I thought would be. But I think it's because people here know, like, how fast a cold spreads. Yeah. Like, I feel like with comics, there is a 
they, they there's a certain point in their young life, whether it's childhood or high school or whatnot, where they know that they are funny and they use that to their advantage somehow, whether that's to make friends or with girls or to get out of trouble or diffuse tense situations. Um, do you know when you knew that you were like, that you were funny and that you weren't just like, you just didn't have a good sense of humor that you, there was something different about the fact that you were funnier than other people that you were around. Do you remember any time in your life when that would have happened? Um, I was really quiet when I was younger Mm -hmm. and uh, I would have friends that were, I would would try to make my friends laugh and then I would have, you know, it was like, it wasn't like, I wasn't a class clown kind of person, Um, but I feel like I was always not more funny, but like more critical and like yeah maybe a little more silly okay i never thought uh, you know until until like high school when my like you know that like the teenager arrogance started to kick in (laughs) then that's when i was just like "Ah, i can make people laugh okay Um, and that's more what i was known for than than a lot of other things and and actually like uh, when I start, I started drawing caricatures. Oh yeah. Uh, I was a caricature artist at Doherty Park. Oh okay. I knew you're an animator, but I didn't know you did caricatures. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's how I started with you know drawing. Awesome. I mean, like professionally or whatever. Okay. But, um, that job required a lot of like um, you know to, like make people laugh but, like. Yeah, because, or whatever. Yeah, because you're just sitting there for yeah. for twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, and and you had to like get people to sit in your chair and all that stuff. Um, and that really that job really brought me out of my shell a lot. Okay. Because also like my boss there was just like you have a good personality for this job, so like, you know. Cool. And then, and then I just got more comfortable, and I you know, and I think it just kind of evolved from there. Okay, so I know so a lot of your a lot of the jokes that you do on on your album, um, your for your earlier album probably mostly more, uh, more than your your latter album. Um, you mostly talk about your parents' divorce, and you talk about um, you ha- you know trying to relate to your father, who's just like a much different person than you are. Did you use humor in any like just in your day to day life interacting with your parents, just because like you were much different than them. Plus there was also a weird situation going on around you. And this was your way of kind of like relating to them. Maybe uh, it was less relating and it was more, uh, diffusion. Okay. Like there's, I feel like there's two parts to it. It's like, it's d- diffusing tension. Um, Cause you know, I was like too young when they were fighting to really figure all that out. Okay. But obviously like then they split and married other people. And then there's all, you know, there was tension with my parents and step parents. And then on top of that, I would, um, move back. I would go back and forth every other week from my mom's to my dad. Oh, wow. So I was basically like this. I was like a visitor every other week. You know what I mean? I was yeah. kind of showing up in this place and like, so you know, trying to not cause any trouble yeah. and get, I'm getting, not cause any trouble there, and then go to my mom's and you know, yeah, it was like a weird. Um, so I don't know. So did I looked, but a lot of a lot of like diffusion and and distraction. So did you feel that you had to be funny because you kind of felt like, oh, you're you're a guest in your own father or your mother's house, and um, I, I'm not, I can't bring much else to the table, so maybe I'll just entertain you guys as a way of like ingratiating myself into this yeah, house. Yeah, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes, um, or it was just a, a also just like a, you know self preservation, like let me make fun of this situation because yeah. I can't you know I can't do shit about it because I'm yeah. a child yeah I mean um, your your joke about the picture day is a perfect joke that I feel like that goes 
Just like, I mean, like, and it's almost when, when your parents heard your picture day, Joe, because I know when you did the shows for, you know, you, you did Buddy and, and my show, your both your parents came out to see you. So it seems like they're very supportive of your career. When you tell a joke yeah, like no. picture day, what, like for the first, the first time they've heard it, do they, are they kind of like, oh shit, was, did we make it weird for you as a kid or did they not get it? My mom has asked like, you know, we didn't like fuck anything up, did we? You know? and, but my dad's kind of like, my dad just kind of laughs about it. Um, Cause I still like my childhood was still better than either of their childhoods as yeah. far as like, you know, help emotionally healthy. Um, nobody hit me. Nobody was an alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, I was definitely like loved. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it, it, it gets weird because that's obviously like the stuff that I mined a lot mm -hmm. for a lot of my earlier material. And there was like, you know, I was a little bit nervous sometimes because I don't want to, it's like one of those things that like, I'm not trying to like get back at them yeah. for anything. Yeah. But I also had come, come to the conclusion like, oh, I'm allowed, this is my life and I'm allowed to do what I want with what I was forced to deal with. So yeah, I'm not throwing anybody at the bus in a big way. Yeah. So I'm, I can do that. And okay. They, they're kind of like, yeah, sure. There was only one time and this happened like not that long ago. And I, I just, it was a tweet. Um, and it was, a, it was, it wasn't totally true to like to mm -hmm. the truth, but it, uh, I, I, I tweeted like, do you know what your your dad and your stepdad have in common besides your mom? <laughs> or what you know your your st dad and stepdad have shared other than your mom uh, are Sebastian Maniscalco clips. <laughs> and it got like a lot of it got a lot of traffic. Yeah. And then I put I got greedy and I posted a screenshot to Instagram. Yeah. And my stepmom follows me on Instagram. <laughs> And she must have got word to my dad, who then got mad and didn't talk to me. He called my mom. <laughs> and, and my mom called me and was just like, your dad's pissed about this. I'm like, why? He, him and my stepdad both liked Sebastian Maniscalco. <laughs> they didn't actually, like, share clips. I know. Yeah. What? But... And, and then I was like, and, and then I felt bad because I was just like, you know, if it's not the truth, then I'm not, I don't want to shit on, if it's something that's the truth. Yeah. And, you know, then I will say like, no, this is what happened. So <laughs> I'm making a public, you, are, you already know what, what I do. Yeah. But when it's something that's an exaggeration, <laughs> then I, I took it, I took it down because I was like, it's not, I don't get paid. If, if, the, if even if the tweet was retweeted by Sebastian. It's yeah. not like he's going to be like, you know, I'm not going to get work out of it. <laughs> so it's not worth it. It was just a funny thought. That was a good tweet, though. I like and it. I, yeah. So I, hey, I still think it's really funny. <laughs> I even tried to, like, explain to my mom, like, I'm like, no, no, no. I said in the tweet, do you know what your stepdad and dad have in common? Yeah. You know, I'm saying, like, <laughs> implying that I yeah. wasn't. <laughs> Really talking, about talking about somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying that the, the, the general, or whatever. Yeah, I'm talking about this guy I know, named Shmim Schmooze. Um, uh, yeah. So, the, um, so you are in the Coast Guard, um, and you try, you try. So wait, were you, you were still like active duty, and you just, and they just yeah. let you go, and you go into Cleveland and tell. So you said in an article, I, I, article I read, you said you got the bug. Explain a little bit, like why you were in the Coast Guard at maybe what between eighteen and twenty-two years old, and then you got the bug. Tell me how you got the bug, and at that age range, and not like in high school, maybe when you were hearing like albums or Comedy Central or whatnot. Well, I always thought I was like obsessed when, I, but when I was in like middle school and high school, I was obsessed with. Um, I think we're we're pretty close in age. Yeah. So you had like stand up spotlight and uh -huh. you know, I watched all those shows. All the, that was when like stand up was all over television. Yeah. So like that was like the you know, 
towards the end of that. But um, I was obsessed with those shows. We had HBO on a cheater box that my dad bought from a guy at uh, at Bethlehem Steel, and uh, I watched comedy specials that I sh- was way too young to be watching. My dad, like like he liked stand up comedy, like he would listen to stuff. Um, so I, w- I always had like an interest in it. There was also like you know my sister and I used to we had a video camera and I and we used to make videos and like. You know, I was always like into it, but mm-hmm. I didn't. I never thought of it as a thing I would end up doing, really, until um, I saw David Tell's show, Insomniac. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that came out like right as I was um, in. I was stationed in Cleveland in the Coast Guard, and I was like watching it, and I was I was just obsessed with it, and I was very unhappy uh, with my job. It, you know, in the Coast Guard. It was just uh-huh. not the environment for me. And I had an office job. So I basically went into the federal building, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, and then the rest of my time, I would, you know, if I never told you that I was in the military, you would have no idea. Yeah. <clears throat> it was like having a, a nine to five, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would go out at night and I, I found, a, I, I think I found this place online. Yeah, you mentioned that. No um, excuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, and it was like uh, just a sports bar in a shopping center kind of thing. And then, you know, you do your first open mic, you meet a bunch of other comics. And that, I remember that was like the March before I my enlistment was up. And then my enlistment was up in that, that following October. And then I could have signed up again because I, I signed up to switch jobs in mm-hmm. the Coast Guard to become an IT guy instead yeah. of a, a human resources basically and because uh, I was really good with computers mm-hmm. and they were like you can you can switch but you have to re-enlist and for another you know three years and I had I, at that point like since the first time I tried the comedy thing I was like ah fuck it I don't belong here I'm going to try this cool, man. comedy thing so and then you, but um, in the same article yeah. I read that you had mentioned that you were also getting the trouble in the Coast Guard. So what yeah. chicken egg situation? What came first? You in comedy and that led to you not taking the Coast Guard so seriously, so you're getting in trouble, or you're getting in trouble and then you're like, Man, I should just do comedy. That's my outlet, not this. I I was getting in trouble first. Okay. I, what was hap- what happened was really I turned twenty one mm-hmm. and I was old enough to drink and I started going out to bars. And if you are 21 and you're going out to bars and you don't, you're not playing in a band or like, you don't have anything to do besides get fucked up. Yeah. You get fucked up. <laughs> uh, and then I, I, that was part of the reason the Atel thing like appealed to me because I was like, this guy, he just gets to travel around and he gets wasted and <laughs> tells jokes and hangs out with like weird people. But I was, I didn't have the other part of it. And then when I started, I, I I got in uh, in trouble just general like behavior stuff. I just was a kid, mm-hmm. um, and I got I got in pretty serious trouble for showing up late and still drunk oh. uh, to duty the one day. Wow! And um, there was no like, oh, that was my moment kind of thing, but that definitely made me go like, oh, this is bad. Uh, and then I and then at some point later on, I I had started comedy not Mm -hmm. long after and then i found that i that alcohol never helped my nerves Mm -hmm. for somebody that's like i'm nervous i need a drink yeah so doing comedy i didn't really drink because i was uh, too scared because i was you know going to do this open mic or i wanted to watch or i wanted to you know whatever so the fact, and so me doing comedy and having something to do at night instead uh-huh. of just drink yeah. is what kind of like steered me in a, in a better direction. Okay. I mean, it, eventually I got used to drinking and performing, <laughs> uh, uh, but I never, I, I, it became a lot more manageable. Okay. And, and so it, did you... It probably saved me a lot more trouble. <laughs> uh, did you... 
did so did you exhaust the Cleveland because I know you filmed your are you um, recorded your first album in Cleveland how long did you do stand up in yeah. Cleveland before you headed back to PA to live live at home to save a few money because you knew you were going to New York like how long were you in Cleveland before you exhausted that that comedy scene um it was about eight eight or nine years I okay think. okay it was a so the first question is like when you get a joke in your head what do you do with it from it clicks into your head if you can walk me through how you get it to wherever whatever channels it goes until you go on stage with it um uh, so basically my the system i've had for a while now um is i always i always carry a notebook i mean i did until recently <laughs> Sometimes I'll still stick it in my pocket, but um, I use these like field notes, oh, okay. notebooks, the little ones, and then like um, I would usually like I try to write something down every day, uh -huh. even if it's just like to do list type stuff. Um, and so whatever ideas and random shit I have just ends up okay, got it down, right? Yeah, and then. What I would do is, like, if I had a spot anywhere, if I had a spot that was, like, this is a, a material kind of spot, uh -huh. either, like, a joke night at the Comedy Cellar uh -huh. or just some random bar show where I'm not getting paid or whatever, yeah. then I would go, I would have whatever I wrote down in the last couple of days, I would kind of put together in a set list. Uh -huh. And then also... See, okay, so that this is my current notebook, and this is the last like wow uh, two two years probably. So there's two albums yeah. of jokes in there, and those ones. Uh, I don't think that I don't think that I was in band stuff was in these notebooks. I didn't start buying these specific notebooks until a little after that. Okay. Um, but I just started because they make like different ones um so they're for different seasons okay so they're called field notes so what what about that specific notebook yeah. do you like about like why versus just like a regular small pocket size notebook I, uh well i like the size of these okay and then, I'll, I'll tell you, so they have like different editions oh cool and as like i, I like design and stuff so like yeah. I, get, I get a kick out of that um and then they the notebooks are thin. They're they're not like a ton of pages. Yeah. So my thought is, if I lose one, I haven't lost, you know, six months worth of writing. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I do is, in the beginning of every notebook, um, I write down <coughs> the like the headlining set. Okay. Set list as it progresses, and then. Uh, you're gonna front, it, but the front is like a little more organized. Okay. I I write all the new stuff from the old notebook. Okay. So every every notebook has this uh, like the long set list, which would be like whatever is gonna be for the album. Yeah. And then premises that have not been worked yet. Okay. And because when I switch notebooks, then it I'm forced to look at everything again. And then uh, I don't lose stuff. And then also I can just get rid of ideas. Because sometimes an idea will go like three notebooks over. And by the time it gets to the third one, I'm like, this is garbage. <laughs> I'm giving up premise. Dude, I love um, that system, man. Yeah, I like these. Because it, then it, it, uh, if I lose one, I haven't lost, like I said. Yeah, everything. A lot. <laughs> and I also, I'll, I'll like put... Um, when I have a bit that's like getting tighter as it gets tighter, uh -huh. I'll usually type it out. Okay. And put it in like Evernote or something. Okay. So I have, uh, you know, the title of the bit and then I write out the beats. So when and then I just add stuff to it. Okay. Well, so when you, when you get the idea and you write it down in your field notes book, do you not look at it again until you hit, hit a stage or are you constantly 
once a day looking at it and to, oh, I got this, I got this show on Thursday that, you know, I want to work this joke on. Or do you look at it before you get on stage or is it just like, oh shit, I forgot about this joke. I'm on stage. Let me just tell it. No, I look at it. I try to, I would try to, uh, my system in New York with a lot of like, um, you know, I would try and go somewhere an hour before the show Mm -hmm. and go through that and jot down a set list and then any, uh, you know, extra ideas that went with whatever premises I wanted to work on. Yeah. But sometimes it would just be like, I'm running late. I have a spot. I want to work on this new thing. I have two words, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's low risk or I, you know, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to back myself into a corner and see what comes out. Um, but I don't do a lot of like sitting and writing pop before I do a lot of later stage sitting and writing. Okay. But not for the beginnings of the joke. Um, I, for your last album oatmeal, when you said like when the joke finally gets into, you know, the final form. So for your last album oatmeal, is there a typewritten joke for each, each joke that you've done on, in your Evernote, like a transcript almost for for those jokes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, as it gets like what I started doing, I, for oatmeal, I, I, I tried to be a little more, um, fast, fastidious or whatever. Is the mm-hmm. word? I don't know. Uh, I try to be a little more like, uh, you know, particular about it there was a lot of jokes on the i was in band album that i didn't feel like were finished okay where i was just like this kind of works and i gotta get i want to fill the time okay uh you know or whatever uh and i didn't want to, i didn't want to have that feeling yeah for the, for oatmeal so well, i was a little more like let me make sure this joke has a beginning middle and end well, dude, for what it's worth, man, I felt like that first album, those jokes were pretty complete, man. That's just a solid, that's just a solid hour. I mean, both of them, but that first one, like I said, that's, it's just, it's crazy. And I, um, let's talk about the joke that you sent me with is how you, how you met your girlfriend. My girlfriend and I have been together for a while. We met on a grinder, actually. Uh, <laughs> turns out we we're both on the wrong app. As a gay dating app. <laughs> she has her lean over, like, what's going on? It's okay. I understand why you wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> I mean, I might be more surprised if you did know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a good relationship. It's fun, you know. She cares about me, wants me to drink water all the time. Huge concern of hers. Always, always suggesting it. That's, uh, you know, her remedy for everything. She's like, you drink enough water? Have you had any water today? She thinks I didn't know what thirst felt like before she showed up. Like, uh, like I've just been wandering the earth. Like, oh, oh, if only there were a simple remedy for this awful feeling. And then she pops out of the bush. She's like, have you tried drinking water? you angel <laughs> she'll brag to other people about how much water she makes me drink she'll be like see that see that grape over there he used to be a raisin that's my boyfriend <laughs> he didn't know he was supposed to be drinking water this whole time he was just an old piece of leather before I showed up just a horse who couldn't find a stream she drinks a lot of water, a lot of water, uh, uses a lot of lotion, very moisturized person. I'd say bordering on slippery, honestly. Oh, you can catch her, but good luck holding on. It's not gonna happen. She uses the face masks at night sometimes, right? Uh, you know, moisturizing masks, whatever. And, uh, so it's like a nice, quiet way of telling me that we're not going to have sex that night. Uh, it's like a little do not disturb sign. I respect it. I come home, I, I see the mask on, and I'm like, copy that. I'm going to go play video games. But I worry that at some point, I'll come home, she'll have the mask on, 
And then I'll be like, so we're not? And then she'll be like, no, nah, let's go for it. And I'll be like, you sure? She'll be like, yeah. And then we'll do it. Then I'll like it, like a little bit more. And then I'll become a mask guy. And then I'll need the mask. Then I'll want the mask all the time. Then I'll feel like a creep. I'll be like, come on, let's do the mask thing. Come on, you're looking a little dry in here. Let's see the... I'll do the... We both do the mask. It's too much. We get along. We get along well. Uh, it is an interracial relationship. She's Puerto Rican. Yeah, I'll never be with another white woman again. Those are her words, not mine, by the way. It's nice being with somebody who has a different cultural background than you. You know, she can like share that with me. You know, because she's she's Puerto Rican. She used to spend her summers there as a kid. She speaks Spanish. Uh, she has stuff with the flag on it and the tiny frogs. <laughs> she cooks the food and she shares that with me and I love it. But I feel bad because I have no culture to share in return because I'm a white guy named Jim. <laughs> She'll be like, try this, it's called mafungo. And I'm like, oh, this is delicious. Have you had the food of my people? It's called granola. Pumpkin spice, that's ours too. So, can, so there's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts to this joke. Um, can you, I mean, I know there's a, I know there, I mean, the, I think the clip's like what, like maybe three, three to four minutes and there's probably about like yeah. 12 punchlines that are just, they all make sense, but like I can tell that you probably came up with them at different times and kind of like weaved them into yep. a tapestry, which is this, this joke. So can you tell me like where where like what happened and what did you write down that field notes book when it came to parts of that joke if you remember like if you were like like in your like if I was with you during these different days that you were writing this joke out from its inception to the final thing we see at on the album can you kind of walk me through that Well so I don't know if you noticed but on I was in band. There's some overlap mm -hmm. to, the, to the oatmeal album yeah. with the joke about drinking up water. Yeah. And I was like real weird about doing that because <laughs> I was like, I don't want to repeat this. But I had, what had happened is I had this is what I'm talking about with the unfinished jokes. Yeah. Right? Like I had the joke about her wanting me to drink more water, and it was a funny joke, and it was fine. But then. After I recorded the album, then I would go out and I would do that joke, and I would keep adding to it. Okay. And I was just working, and the more stuff was working with it, so I was like, "Well, shit, I'm not gonna like ditch all this other stuff and then leave out one good joke." Yeah. Just for the people that are really paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I'm gonna put, I'll put one, I'll put, have a, a better version of one of the same jokes. Yeah. On the next album, I, but that's what I, the joke I was using to start this next chunk that just kept getting added to. Yeah. So I had the I heard you know drinking up water, and then um, the mask stuff came about naturally because yeah. it's like true yeah. story. Um, the, and then what? How, how does that one? Well, the one thing I would bring up is you talk about how your girlfriend uses lotion and you, and you mentioned that she's slippery and just the word slippery is the perfect word for that joke. That's the funny, that's the funniest word that goes with that. Where, how many different words did you use until slippery was the one that was like, this is the one I'm, this is the one that unlocks the rest of the bit. Uh, that one, I feel like was a, uh, an, an improv. Okay. Um, where, cause that, like this is what I'm talking about when I have I guess a set somewhere where I'm doing like new stuff. I try to just keep adding. It's kind of like what I like that David Tell does uh -huh. is he he's a little more like surreal, but like when you watch him, he's just adding to the, his jokes by saying the next funny thing in this like rhythm. It's more like rhythmic. Yeah. But he's just seeing what more he can say, uh, you know, until it until it dies. Yeah, and that's kind of what I would do with new stuff, where it's just like I'm not necessarily tagging it. I just I'm trying to keep talking in the same yeah vein. 
So I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that I don't remember struggling with that one. That was just like an aside kind of, and it, it hit and I kept it. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the thing that wasn't working for a while was the, the, um, the, the joke about like foods that white people eat basically. Oh, the juice bar the joke? Yoshi. What's that? The juice bar joke? No, no, no. That's, oh. Uh, this is on, this, on oatmeal. Oh. So I didn't always say oatmeal. You know, in the first clip, the one from yes. uh, the seller. You say granola. I, I say granola. Yeah. And I would, I, for like, probably like a year, I was like, I kept saying granola. I would try like pumpkin spice. I'm like <laughs> potatoes. I'm like, just all these, like every, and I was like texting, I texted, um, my friend Ramon Rivas. Um, I forget who else I texted. I texted my friends that were not white to be like, "What do you when, I, when you think of white people food? What do you think?" And everybody was like granola, um, mayonnaise, you know. Yeah. The standards. And then the one night I remember, I was I was, I was opening for uh, Jimmy O Yang in um, Arlington. Yeah. Yeah. And I was I hit that joke and I was just I was feeling loose. And I just said uh, I said oatmeal and because I was like, okay, the the mission for this set is to find keep find need to keep finding yeah. a better word. And then I said oatmeal and it was like I don't know if it was because the audience was like like seventy five percent Asian. <laughs> um, Jimmy O'Yang had to do yeah, that. yeah. Asian fan base. Yeah. So maybe it helped that it was not a room full of white people, but um, the the word oatmeal hit harder than any other word it hit before. And it, I, I was like, All right, I can't wait to try this again. Yeah. And then I kept trying it, and then I worried. I was like, okay, there it is. I found it. <laughs> that's awesome. So and then it, it, I just. That's why I titled the album that because yeah. it was like one word and it yeah. was kind of funny and it has you know. No, that's great. Every word has a texture. It's a texture. It's a color. It's a food. So you you put a lot of I, I I do have a whole section I want to talk about your albums with. So I don't know if I should wait till then, but but maybe I, I, for this question, what um so you there you put a lot of thought into naming your albums. Is that you? Because oatmeal, you said there. I mean, I. I, I would say may, maybe not a lot. I don't sit down and go like, all right, mm-hmm. you know, let's plan this out. I just kind of like, you know, like though. I mean, I put yeah, I put some thought into it. Like the oatmeal thing yeah. was kind of like, obviously, like I was in band, is yeah good because it's like. It's a thing you can put on a T-shirt, or yeah. Like that, you know, <laughs> that's a good album title. Anything that you can make merch out of, yeah. Um, but for this one, I, there was nothing on the album that felt like it had that. So I was like, let me try. You know, let me just do something more silly, and you know, hopefully memorable. Or okay. So, and you also mentioned another part, which is, Mike, what brings me to the question, how integral is it to bounce off jokes with other people? So you just mentioned that you texted friends about the right word for, at that time, is granola the right word or should it be oatmeal or should it be something else? Do you, for bits that you have, do you run them by friends or your, or your, or your girlfriend or people you know or, or, uh, or comics that you are in the circle with who are like, like Ted Alexandro, for instance? Are, do you feel comfortable running something by him, or, or is he too is he too far out to, to do that kind of thing? And you feel I don't know weird about k- kind of going to him, but like, do you, is it important to bounce stuff off of people, or do you try to just go at it without anyone's influence and see what happens on its own? Um, it depends on who I'm with, but I do like to bounce stuff around, and that's one of the cool things. Honestly, like my favorite comedy seller thing mm-hmm. um, that I didn't know would be my favorite thing was uh, they do new joke night. So like Mondays and Thursdays, they would put on a show <clears throat> where everybody does like five minutes in mm-hmm. uh, the Fat Bad Pussycat. It's like their side room and the tickets are cheaper mm-hmm. and it's, you know, advertised like just as people, you know, trying stuff out. But 
you would go hang out there and everybody that cycles through is like sitting at this, you know, one of the tables, like, um, Hey, what do you think about this? Like, mm-hmm. what do you think about this? It's that's way more of a workshop thing than a, than a, like a, just a late night bullshit. Thing. Yeah. Um, but that was definitely one of my favorite things to do was like, you know, talk to whoever was there. Sometimes it was Ted. Uh-huh. A lot of times like Todd Barry, I, I would talk to a lot. Gary, Gary Beater. Oh yeah. Greg Stone. Yeah. Michelle Wolf was there wow. all the time. Uh, you know, like, and, and people would come through it. Yeah. There's definitely some people I wouldn't be like, Hey, Hey David, tell what do you think about this? <laughs> uh, but you know, like, Get, like Gary Goldman would talk to you about it, you uh-huh. know. Like there's just like, yeah. I definitely. I think that's part of. That's that's one of my. That was one of my favorite parts when I started, and it's still one of my favorite parts. <clears throat> and it's super helpful, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um. And as a matter of fact, I did, these like kids um, from Germany saw me open for Todd. You know. And the one reached out to me because he's a comedian in, in Germany. Yeah. And he, they speak fluent English, obviously. But <laughs> um, they were like, hey, will you do our podcast? I forget what it's called, but it's basically like where you, you work on bits with yeah. the host and yourself. And you kind of go around the horn. That's cool. And I was doing it with these kids that are like three or four years in <laughs> and over – you know, Zoom yeah. or Skype or whatever, and uh, it was like it was like so much fun. I didn't. I, I felt like they were trying to wrap it up, and I was like, wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh yeah, this part of it's like still one of the best parts. Yeah. Do do you use social media as a way to kind of validate some of your stuff? I mean, I know you talked you talked about the beginning with the Twitter yeah. joke, but. Do you use that as a way? Oh, I got so many likes. This must be good. Let me go ahead and. Um, I, I don't always use it as a like absolute mm-hmm. gauge, but I definitely use it. Uh, especially like now, if there's nowhere to go, like yeah. what the fuck else? Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> but I definitely would like tweet throughout the week, and then when I would sit down to like compile things, yeah, I would I check my Twitter. And see, like, okay, oh yeah, right, that could do well, or you know, this bombed, but I think it would be better if I spoke spoke it out or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I, I use it. I try. If I have something that's just not, it's nice because it's like you can try out. It's almost like a premise check, mm-hmm. where it's like, if I can distill this thought into such a short format and it resonates, I can make it a. Fu- I'm in a bit. Yeah. Okay. You know. Um, and so do you record all your sets? And if you do, do you edit in any way? Because it seems like you just, you have your field book. And then if it's like a super good joke, that's not going to be part of your headlining set. You'll type it out. But is there an editing process, physical, physical editing process that you do? Or is it all just. The, yeah. So the writing part of it, the typing part, like the Evernote part. Yeah. Is, uh, where I use the audio. So I, I would like, I was in a, I was in a good flow for a while before I taped the oatmeal album. Uh-huh. I just had a lot. I was getting a lot of stand up work, which means I had a lot more time during the day. Yeah. Um, I would listen to the set I did like the night before, just like voice memo recorder. And if I had something in that set that I liked that went with, then I would like, type that into the, you know, and basically I would have a note for each joke. Okay. Like I never file and I would start it and I would just add whatever, you know, if I did this random tag on Tuesday night, that would be in the Evernote file. If I did this random tag on Thursday night, that would I end up in the Evernote file. And then I would, you get a better picture of it and then you can d- edit it down. Okay. And then you try the better version of the joke the next time you go out or whatever. Is there material that you won't do? And if you come up with a great punchline, whether it's politics, race, sex, is there stuff that you will not touch? Um, no, not really. I but I'm I'm like 
weirdly aware of, and I think this goes for a lot of comics, some are more aware of it than others, but there's certain t topics that like <clears throat> people will tolerate from you, mm -hmm. and certain topics people won't tolerate just based on their judgment or the kind of the vibe you put forward. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if I got up there and started doing like real, like aggressively bro y stuff, <laughs> yeah. or was just like very like in your face, it would probably be off putting because I'm like 5'7 <laughs> and like I have these glasses. I'm just kind of like gentle looking. Um, <laughs> Gen oh, gentle looking. <laughs> Well, and, and like also it's weird too because like when I was younger I was like oh everyone you know is I would do a very I would do a lot of really cute jokes yeah and they worked because I was like I looked the part yeah I was like young and clean shaven and whatever <laughs> but you can't and then you you're like and then it's like you're almost forty and like you look tired and you, you can't get away with cute jokes anymore. <laughs> But you also can't, like, dive in on race, yeah. you know, or whatever, in some, like, hard way. <laughs> it just, so, there's, the, I have thoughts on everything. Mm -hmm. I've written, you know, in personal blogs and, or not blogs, but, like, you know, just jotting ideas on, I've written about everything. But I'm a little more aware of, like, what, what people are going to tolerate from me and what, like works best within an album. Yeah. You know? Okay. I, I I try not to like constrict myself too much, but I also feel like if you went to see if you went to see um, I'm trying to think of a if you went to see Metallica and yeah. they played a country song, yeah. I'd be like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's kind of how I view it. It's we all have to stick to some genre, but at least yeah. st stick to the genre. Yeah. In, in like, throughout the evening. Yeah, you're right. Like people have a brand. Like Jim Gaffigan, as we've been talking about, him, obviously has a certain brand. If he came out there and started telling jokes, like um, I don't know, I can't think of like who's like a filthy comic. I I'm just, I, I don't know, like a George Carlin kind of thing. Like people be like, what are yeah, we watching like right now? Play. Yeah, dice yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd be like, what is this? Yeah. I wonder if he wants to do that. I always want to know if Gaffigan ever just wanted to, like... I'm sure, like, behind the scenes, like, maybe in, like, shows that you've done, he's been dirty, but not, like, in a setting where I would see him. I just don't know if he would ever just be, break them up, break them. Um, my, um, how much thought do you uh, put into your stage presence and your demeanor? And then sub-question is, your stage presence is very, like, calm and, like, collected, but what happens when you're in, like, a ro rowdy bar and people, like don't care that there's comedy going on. So can you tell me about how much thought goes into your stage presence and what you do when you're not in like a comedy club setting and it's kind of loud and people are not being cooperative? I, tr I try to put the least amount of conscious thought into my stage presence now where it like just get, get as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely some times where the energy of the room will get to me and I, I will speed up or um, try and be more energetic. Okay. And it's just not. It doesn't. It doesn't look good on me. Uh -huh. if I because I, I've gone through phases like that where people are like, you need to be more energetic, and I like try to do it, and then you watch a tape of it, and it's just like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> um, and I, you know, I've learned from like again, like watching. Like Todd Barry was one of my favorite comedians, mm -hmm. and then I get to watch him a lot. I'm open for him, yeah. hang out with him, and that man does not alter. Yeah, he does not change the way he speaks in front of a crowd, no matter what is happening. <laughs> interesting. And it's like it's like it works. So it's like you know what I mean. Like again, it would be weird if he did otherwise. Yeah. Um, for the second question, I used to panic. Sometimes I'll still, I still will. I mean, used to, at the remember at, in, uh, at the winery, yeah. things got a little weird because my uh, my that, uh, that table up front was drunk. And oh yeah, 
my ex girlfriend was there, <laughs> her mom, and they were. Um, and I, I like. I used to be. I try to remind myself that this is a live event. Uh huh. And while you, it, you, like it is. It's like I'm like I want to get my jokes out and tell my jokes and work on this thing. I have to remind myself. These people are out for a night. They don't get. Why would they give a shit about you? Yeah. They didn't. <laughs> they don't know who the fuck you are. Like, <laughs> so like relax and let it be. Try and be let it be what it's gonna be. Okay. Because it's live performance. <laughs> okay. Um. But I've definitely learned to, to um, kind of lasso a more wild room. Okay. And it's fun to do once in a while, but it's exhausting sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to ask you about your album. I'm sorry, what did you just say? Oh, I said it's a good muscle to have. Yes, yes. No, agreed. Um, so I want to talk about your albums, and I want to know, like, first question, like, how did you know when it was right to do your both your albums? How did you, like, was it a feeling? Was it like, I'm going to just do five years, and then that's going to be, like, my capstone, I can move on? Like, what, how did you know it was right to do both those albums at, the, at those specific times? Um, I, I really didn't. The, with the I Was In Band album, I, I was, like, kind of spinning my wheels, and, um... I, I had written a book and I had like tried to sell another one and it didn't sell. <clears throat> and I was working a day job that I wasn't crazy about, like a production job. But, uh -huh. um, and I was like kind of frustrated and I had an open offer from Rooftop, the record label. They were like, hey, if you ever want to do an album, let us know. And I was like, all right, I need to pick a, a time, you know, some month to have that I'm going to tape this album and then just go, just dive in, yeah, just make it work. And I, I did that to kind of, so to give me something to work towards. Okay. And then that that was helpful for my mental state for sure. Um, but for the I didn't want to do it that way the second time. So then the the next one I was like, I feel like I have, you know. I'm I'm getting to the point where I have enough stuff. Yeah. Let me, you know, schedule a recording, start get that process going. Uh -huh. Figure out where to do it and when to do it, and then keep going. So it was like, which was a way more comfortable way of doing it. Okay, cool. The hard part with that album is like you you want the room full of people that kind of know who you are, uh -huh. maybe. And I my goal was I'm not going to do a second album until I know I can fill the room to record the album, but that didn't really happen. Okay. So I, the room I did it in was full, but not because of me, it was because it was a, a weekend room that always fills up. Okay. Uh, um, and so it was all strangers, but... So, um, and then did, when you did the album, what was... Did you scrap all the material then, once you released it, or were you still doing the same jokes from the first album after it was already available to whoever wanted to buy it? Um, after the first one, I, I had some overlap, because, again, like, I'm not an, any sort of name, so it's not like I have, it's not like, uh, Somebody asked me, like, after I recorded the album, they're like, so you starting from scratch? You throwing out all that old stuff? And I'm like, no, nobody's fucking heard it. I'm like, still. <laughs> so I'm not going to throw it away. Like, I, I don't, I'll i use as little and little of it as possible okay. until I use none of it. Okay. Um, but if I was, like, more well-known, I might have a different approach, but... Yeah. Okay. Um, and so when I hear those albums, um, is what I'm hearing like a complete, accurate, what ha like a one-time how you told the jokes, or did you? I, I think you said the first. I think your the first one was just one show, but was that the same with the second one, or were there multiple shows and you edited together? Did you edit jokes? So I talked to a guy who just did an album where he actually edited a joke from a previous month 
into the album that was not on the night that he actually recorded it because it was a better it was a better recording for that one specific joke. Did you do anything like that? Did you doctor the album in any way? Obviously not with like other people did, stuff, but I did. Um, t it was two shows, mm -hmm. and the the album is it's a mix. It's mostly the late show, but it, there's a couple things from the early show that just worked better. Okay, where it would have been like, you know. It, it it would have been it would have felt foolish to be like no I'm you know <laughs> I had these two shows ideally it would have been great if I could have just said use the late show go yeah. for it um but there was just there was like um and it, uh, somebody heckled me but I like the line I improvised on the early show was like so much better and I was like put you know put that in from yeah. that show. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I only did it in one shot before because I didn't, I couldn't get the room full for a second time. Okay. <laughs> and now it's different, like, albums kind of get pieced out into tracks, so mm -hmm. yeah. it's... Absolutely. And so, did, did you any, what help did you have getting that album together? Did you have, like... Was there somebody that kind of oversaw the entire process and just you were just responsible for getting to the show and doing the jokes? Or were you like, you gotta, you gotta make sure people, you gotta sell tickets, you gotta like tell the recording guy what you want, you gotta, you know, or was there somebody that kind of had your back and was doing all like the front office stuff while you just worried about your set? The, the first one was a little less front office, but I still had it because mm -hmm. um, I had the record label. I have my manager uh -huh. um, who helped with stuff, and you know. But I, I recorded in Cleveland, so I was a little more hands-on with getting people out to the show. Um, and then the second one, I worked with the same guy, but he started his own record label, and he was a little more hands-on. Okay. But they like it's easier with the label because they they find an audio engineer if they have to. They um, help you with the venue. That you know what I mean, like. I've done, I, these two albums are my two official ones, but mm -hmm. I did self-distributed ones before that. Okay. That I just kind of like got rid of because I was like, I don't, they're fine, but like, I don't, if people look me up, I want them yeah. to hear the stuff I want them to hear. Okay. Um, but doing it myself was hard, you know? Yeah. And I didn't want, like... Yeah. Ideally, you don't want to have to do. You want to do less of that shit. Yeah. As possible. Yeah. No, I I can only I can understand. Um, well, thank you, dude. Both albums are great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link um to the um am the links to the Amazon, iTunes, Spotify to your albums on this, along with uh, your website. And then, dude, I came across you have a cool podcast, Quitting Comedy, with like some fucking. Yeah. A-list kind of comics on there, and I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I not know about this until I started Googling you? It's like, I don't think it's even on your website, yeah. is it? Do you even promote it on your website? Uh, it, it should be. It okay. Should be. Um, but but that's like, also awesome. But did you, did you, I think the last one was like, like a year ago, this month or something like that, that you did the last episode. Okay. The last episode of Quitting Comedy. It's been like yeah. a year, right? It was a while ago. Okay. Um, Ironic. I mean, I, I thought about bringing it back, but I got too um, bad with consistency. And uh, I was. It's a good podcast, I think. Yeah. But it was tough to talk to people about quitting of that frequently. <laughs> <laughs> Where I was just like, this is it. I I know people like it, but like, it it was it became a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, dude. It was a, I, it was cool. I, I listened to the Ted Alexander one because I, I love Ted and uh, Robert Dean. Um, is there anything else you want to you want me to add or plug or anything like that? If, this is probably not going to get released for another month or two. But is there anything that you want me to link to besides okay. your website? Just the albums. Okay, absolutely, man. Those are and they're just fucking great albums too. Um, thank you. No, dude. No, thank you for doing them. It's it's crazy how like perfect those jokes it's intimidating it's intimidating to know that those that there's like people like you out there and i was like oh i got so much more work to do because yeah, you're coming up with great shit um 
Uh, so, <laughs> so how much new stuff do you think you have from that album? Like from from the end, from when that album came out, where where are you building the third set, the third album set? Uh, barely. Yeah. Because that I taped that at the end of September. Okay. And then we hit lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> in March. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was writing stuff, but I wasn't writing a lot. I was like. Uh, laying back a little bit. Okay. So I've I've written I've actually written quite a bit under quarantine, but it's a lot of quarantine related stuff. So yeah. Dude, Ted enough. just did his special, like his like um I don't know how he can do it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I listened to it. It's great, but I was like, I don't have the balls to do anything like that. <laughs> There's no <laughs> audience. I I can't do it. He's a better man for it. Um, it's it's hard. <laughs> oh, well, dude. Well, dude, thank you so much for sharing everything today. I super appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for talking to me and the, and, and the nuggets. I do. I love the field book. I got to check those out for myself. Um, thanks again, man. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon, dude. Take care, buddy. You too, Mark. See ya. Take care. See ya. All right, that's it. That's our interview with Jim Tews. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, truly, this was such a, a gift to be able to sit and talk to Jim um, for what was two hours. You saw an edited version of that, but uh, he was such a, a nice guy and just get, and just so uh, giving in what I was asking. Um, and I hope that everyone was able to learn as much as I did uh, about how his system works. And, and I've adopted a few of those things myself. If it works for Jim, it obviously must work. Uh, because he is, he, he's definitely one of the, those comics who is just a pleasure to see and, and is definitely somebody who um, I hope to be at a level at someday. So I want to thank Jim and I hope everybody loved this episode. Please subscribe to this channel so that we can keep giving you more episodes like this one. Um, and uh, we'll see you next Monday with another episode of Get to the Joke. All right, guys, take care.